Uh, I'm going to be talking about uh, the Kautilian uh, approach to the 2022 uh, Sri Lankan economic crisis. Uh, as we have uh, studied under uh, a wonderful subject uh, with uh, Professor Devidatta Mahapatra, uh, we've understood the theories that were uh, put in place a long time ago, and these theories were almost at the same time as Sun Tzu uh, in China. Mic up. Lift up the mic. Lift it up. Okay. I hope you're getting uh, everything above my forehead as well. I'll just go down. Okay, that's better. Okay, that works. Thank you. So just just, just to recap uh, the timing, uh, as far as we have understood it, Sun Tzu is the oldest around the fifth century BCE. Kautilya uh, is the fourth century BCE. However, he builds on a lot of work that predates Sun Tzu, and about eighteen hundred years later comes Machiavelli's Prince and Discorso. So we're talking about some very old work, a very old treatise with a lot of very relevant advice today. We'll start now going into how it is applied to Shri, the Sri Lankan crisis. Can't go up, so I have to go down. Okay. So we've had, uh, as, as some, of you, some of us have been following, and of course the crisis has largely sort of dissipated. We don't talk about it as much. Uh, several years of mismanagement, political economic mismanagement, led to a problem for Sri Lanka. And uh, about two years ago, uh, India stepped in as a great, tremendous benefactor, much appreciated by the local uh, Sri Lankan leadership. Uh, there is a word in terms of what uh, Kautilya talks about as the main conqueror, the Vijigisu. Uh, that's the third bullet. And... Uh, in terms of the conqueror, what is the aim? And has anybody over here through their lives ever heard of India trying to conquer and reabsorb Sri Lanka? I don't think so. I mean, we don't, it's not how we think. Uh, one of the, uh, uh, and it's because of an embedded reason. And in terms of uh, how we, uh, how Kautilya approaches it, hi guys, do you mind? I can hear you. I can hear you again. Uh, so in terms of the advice that Kautilya gives, it's about political unification of the Indian subcontinent. And, it, uh, and to politically unite does not mean conquest, but really being on the same page. Uh, and in, the, in those terms, it is in India's interest to ensure the political and economic stability and turn it into a stronger ally. And that's both an aim, but it's also a question. So we'll explore that. Yeah, so we have gone uh, and looked at uh, the work built, the seminal work built by Rangarajan and Kangli, of course, is the, is the uh, most recommended source. Uh, and then comes Rangarajan in the 1990s. Mitra and Leibig have done a phenomenal survey. And then having this as the theoretical background, we go further and look at how and what happened to Sri Lanka, how its GDP uh, has been affected and so forth. Okay, I'll skip this right now in the interest of time, but basically this is a sort of a map of how India with itself at center, what sort of relationships it has uh, with its different uh, neighbors. The, the, the various Kautilian theories that come into play, and uh, I won't go into the theories of all of them, but you know, you do have uh, a four cluster approach uh, where when it comes to uh, Sri Lanka, we are looking at reconciliation and gift giving as the primary approach. It is a continuum. It is not, India is not looking at Sri Lanka as trying to be threatening in a time of its political chaos at all. Uh, in terms of the calamities that sri lanka may face these are also of importance to india strategically because it wants to ensure sri lanka is, is stable and does not have any after effects uh, on india we do have also a civilizational continuum with sri lanka where uh, it is a dharmic continuum we have hindus buddhists jains 
and all of this, there in fact is no Sri Lanka, there is no uh, epic, and I'll come to that, uh, our, one of our greatest, one of our two greatest epics very centrally places Sri Lanka in its story. And yeah, we know, I don't even have to mention the epic's name, I'll come to that. Uh, in terms of how Sri Lanka uh, has received the aid in a very positive and timely manner, uh, it has sent a very positive signal to the world that India is here to be very helpful in times of crisis. And this is not just uh, uh, something that Sri Lanka has experienced. We've all seen uh, these sorts of uh, uh, messages coming in from different countries in Africa, the Americas, the Caribbean, about how India stepped in, for example, during the time of COVID. And that has also been applied here, specifically with Sri Lanka, to bring it back to a, a stage where it can, it can continue to function. Uh, as uh, my fellow panelists said over here, it's, there's much more detail that we will go into in my paper, which will be available to many of you. So here I'm just talking about the high level, the highlights. Uh, now let me go into some concepts uh, that were not or were partly touched, and we will go into them again uh, regarding Sri Lanka as the example. There are many words that are used in terms of a, con a, a country's culture or history. And so, you know, a couple of uh, Pierre Bordeaux's word that he uses is habitus, which is all these intrinsic factors that uh, sort of are embedded in a country. Uh, Francois Bordel uses the term long durée, which is the long cultural civilizational mem memory, which is a bridging principle that is continue, that is a continuum. In India's case, it goes back a very long time. Uh, as I mentioned, in terms of how Chanakya views what the strong power, centralizing power in India should do, it is not to go and destroy other powers that oppose it, but to unify the Indian subcontinent politically. Uh, the state is an econ economic actor, even though there are largely economics being placed into private hands, but the state is definitely an actor on its own. There is also a great sense of continuum in the sense of having a hybrid modernity. So you've got a modern state that always progresses. It is not devoid of liberalism and progressivism, yet it is a traditional carryover that is not forgotten. Uh, India is, uh, as, as Mitra and Leibig have pointed out, based on how many other political commentators have looked at India as it goes through its ebbs and flows of history, India is not an emerging power. It emerges in the sense of being a re-emerging power. It, uh, and so it's not something new. And as India uh, emerges and re-emerges, uh, it will not leave Sri Lanka behind. It will not want its neighbors to be that behind it. So that's in its interests, and it will not maintain its relationship based on nativist narrow-mindedness that purely favors India. One second. As I mentioned earlier, there is no Ramayana without Lanka, and this is we are we are epically indispensable to each other, not Sri Lanka indispensable to India, but to each other. The Dharmic continuum uh, extends well into Eastern Asia and also into China. We also know that, for example, with China, uh, there is really no known conflict with the Chinese civilization on the Eastern seaboard until maybe the early part of the 20th century due to a foreign arrival and power coming into India, not because of their own mutual interactions. Uh, there have been missteps, mishaps in the India-Sri Lanka political relations since the time of the mid 20th century. These are missteps, but they're very correctable, but they're not of a long duration that will affect their relationship. And this is crisis of two, three years ago of this 21st century is actually a great opportunity to prove that, and I believe it is being proved. Uh, as of now, as Sri Lanka rebounds as an island nation, it also has tourism as its great potential. It, one fifth of tourism in Sri Lanka is Indian, and that is growing. 
and we are seeing increased <laughs> developments in the fields of defense and technology. So all in all, it looks like not only is Sri Lanka on the rebound and uh, in a better position than before, and that India has played its role, or, or overall it's a win-win. And uh, in a way, when we trace it back to the teachings of uh, Kautelia from more than two millenniums ago, we can see that Chanakya Kautilya basically uh, is very relevant even today, and his teachings uh, are timeless. So that's how we look at it, and this is one sort of example. That's it.